is the seed in the bond. Amen. Don't let that seed stay in the bond. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. What? Okay, Isaac's sick with a fever. Let's pray for Isaac. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that fever. We say, fever, go in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, to be able to curse that fever in the powerful name of Jesus, and it will flee and go. And we thank you for his healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you ready for the word this morning? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> Don't be scared. Or as they say, scared. Don't be scared. My wife can give me a little bit of water. I'd appreciate that. <clears throat> My water girl's been slipping lately. Slacking. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. It's always powerful. It's always true. Father, we know that, God, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Let's pay attention. And we're praying to all that we ask in faith. You're able, Lord, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask. All that we ask. Exceedingly. Abundantly. Above. All that we ask. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless your word, Lord, as it goes forth today. In Jesus' name. Let it be accomplished of those things that you want to accomplish in our hearts and minds. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, uh, I want to share with you the effective word. The effective word. The Word of God needs to be effective. It's not something that just lays on the pages of a book that's laying on your table that collects dust. It's an effective Word. It brings life. It brings a reality of who God is in our everyday circumstance. And in order to have the Word of God to be effective in our lives, there are four things you and I must do in order to see the manifestation of its effectiveness. The word effective means successful in producing a desired or intended result. And God's word is never to return void. It's never to be unused. It's never to accomplish um, just nothing. It accomplishes something Every time you and I hear or open the Word of God. It's sad because so many today are not opening the Word of God and preaching from the Word of God. They're preaching stories and fairy tales and all kinds of things. The word effective also means to be successful, potent, and powerful. And so these four things must be done in order to see the manifestation of its effectiveness. Number one, we must listen to the Word of God. Amen? Say it with me. We must listen to the Word of God. The Bible says that if any man has ears to hear, let him what? Hear what the... Spirit has to say to the churches. Now, we all have ears. I think everyone in here has an ear. Has two of them. That's why you should listen twice as much as you speak. Praise God. 
We all have ears, but when it says, let us hear what the Spirit has to say, it's not in the natural hearing. In Revelation, you see him speaking to the seven churches, and every one of those churches, he says, if any man has ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God has to say to the churches. And sometimes God will speak in different manners in different ways. Do you know that God can use unsafe people to speak to you? Do you know that God can use circumstances and situations to speak to you? Do you know that God can cause a jackass to speak? You know, we all grew up with Mr. Ed. Remember that? Anything you say, Wilbur. Remember him? We used to have uh, Francis the Talking Mule way back when. But God can use a donkey if he so chooses. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he can use a donkey if he wants. Or he can use just plain old me. And just plain old you. But God does speak today, amen? He speaks to us in diverse manners and fashions. And these four things must be done. First, we must listen to the Word of God, but there can be hindrances to hearing the Word of God. And let me, uh, before I go on, I forgot all about it. We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you this morning. We love you. Thank you for joining us, Sajiv over there in India, and also Linda up there in Maine. God bless you. And any others that are tuning in to listening, God bless you. We hope God's word will bless you today. But there can be hindrances to hearing the word of God, such as having our ears dull of hearing. Now, how can this happen? How can our hearing be dull? One way is to have a stubborn spirit operating through our flesh. The Bible says that stubbornness is as the sin of iniquity and idolatry. Iniquity is knowing something is wrong and doing it anyway. That's what iniquity is. Iniquity is knowing that something is wrong and doing it anyway. And idolatry is serving another god in some fashion. Now remember, idols cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot think, cannot speak, and cannot do anything. But one thing is for sure, and that is this. You immolate that which you worship. If you are not hearing God, and you are, you are, and you are stubborn, hello? You won't hear. You won't hear spiritual things. You won't see spiritual things. You emulate that which you worship. Some worship a God of unbelief. Some worship a God of double-mindedness. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 10 says this, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed, and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. So those that are allowing a hindrance to hearing are those who have closed their ears, they cannot hear, and they have no delight in God's Word. Do you have a delight in God's Word? Do you enjoy being in God's Word? Do you enjoy having a fellowship with God through His Word? Or is it an occasional acquaintance? Do you only pick it up when you feel inspired? 
God wants you to move beyond the feelings of inspiration to picking up his word every day. Amen? They have no delight in it. They'll read everything and anything else. Hello? They'll read their favorite books, their favorite articles, periodicals, newspapers. They spend more time in all of those things than they do in God's Word. And then they wonder why God is not answering their prayer, and they wonder why God is not moving on their behalf. In order to have the effect of Word, you must listen to the Word of God. Jeremiah 25, verse 7. It says, yet you have not, oh, he doesn't have it yet, okay, I'll wait. Jeremiah 25, verse 7 says, yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, in order that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. When you sit and read the word of God, it's not just to read it, it's also to listen. Because as you're reading, God is speaking to you. Spending time with God is a dialogue, not a monologue. It's not just sitting there asking Him for help and asking Him for this and asking Him for that. Think if you had a husband or a wife or someone you cared about and you could never get a word in edgewise. Wouldn't that be a little frustrating to you? Good to me. Can't even say anything. Yet God wants to have a dialogue with you and with me. He says, You do not listen to me in order that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. In other words, a lot of things that you're doing is self-inflicted because you will not listen to me. How many times God, in that still small voice, said, don't go there. Don't get on there. Don't do that. You don't want to do that anymore. But are we listening? Jeremiah 11.10 says they have turned back to, their, to the iniquities of their ancestors. Let me stop there for a moment. And here's some of the excuses we give to God. Well, my mother was like that, her mother was like that, her mother was like that, and so that's the way I am. My father was like that, my grandfather was like that, my great-great-grandfather was like that, my great-great-great-grandfather was like that, my great-great-great-great-grandfather was like that. So that's why I'm the way I am. They turn back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which what? Refuse to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. When you stop listening to the word of God, you are headed in the direction of idol worship. When you begin to listen to someone or something else other than the word, you begin to move in the direction of idolatry. They refuse to hear my words. You know when you refuse to hear God's words? When you exalt your opinion above God's word. Then your, your opinion becomes your God. You begin to serve that God 
and you will not bow down to the God, and you will not listen to the God of the Bible. You listen to the God of your opinions. That's idolatry. Well, I don't think this, and I don't think that, and I don't have to do this, and I don't have to that. If it's contrary to the word, yes, you do. They have turned back to the iniquities of their ancestors who refused. How do you refuse? Well, refusal can be up front. I'm not doing it. Or it can be subtle. You ever have talked to a person and not listening to you? Sometimes I see that on someone's face here in church. You can tell by their face they're not listening. But that's okay. Because they can't stand before God and say they have not heard. Because God is using this little vessel here today to speak to you. They refuse to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their father. So the first thing we must do is we must what? Must hear. The second thing we must do is believe the word. It's one thing to hear the word, but it... In conjunction to hearing, you must also believe the word. But there can be hindrances to believing the word of God. Such as this. Number one, self-perception. Self-perception. You can perceive something in the natural which will nullify the supernatural. Are you hearing me? You can nullify the spiritual by self-perception. I don't believe God does that anymore. I don't believe God, God heals anymore. I don't believe God can deliver me anymore. How many know that believing has action? In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, you know the story. Jesus is before his own family, and he did some mighty things, and, and they said, Is not he the carpenter, the son of Mary? And the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters too? Oh, by the way, if you're Catholic, sorry. Jesus had sisters. Living here among us? This proved a hindrance to their believing in him. I'm reading from the uh, 20th century version. It actually says, this proved a hindrance to their believing. Why? Because they were self-perceiving something in the natural. Oh, he's, isn't this the carpenter's son? The son of Mary? All natural stuff. All real stuff. But they were perceiving in the natural, and they never even once said, isn't he the son of God? Isn't he God in human flesh? No. They had ears to hear, but could not hear. They had eyes to see, but could not see. You must believe the word. It's one thing to hear it, but you must have the conjunction of hearing, but also believing the word. Self-perception. Trying to look at things only from the natural mind, having absent faith, can only lead to unbelief. Amen? Self-perception can be a killer 
to believing. Let me give you an example. I know I read in the Bible that God provided for people. But He can't provide for me. I've asked God for this, I've asked God for that, and He's never given it to me. So this self-perception takes over, causes them to unbelieve the Word of God. That is a trick of the enemy. It's been a trick of the devil from the very beginning. To always question God's Word. Mark, uh, let me say this. Uh, let me back up a minute. Another thing that can also hinder believing in the Word is suffering. When a person goes through suffering, whether it be physical or mental, it can, if allowed, be a hindrance to believing. Have you ever prayed for somebody and they got healed? I have. You ever pray for yourself and you ain't got healed? I remember David Diamond telling me when his first daughter was born, uh, she was born, still born, and she, she was dead. And the devil came to him and spoke to him and said, Ah, look at you. You go and pray for the dead, and, and, and you go pray for other people to be healed, and they're healed, but your own daughter couldn't be healed. What kind of God is that that doesn't even care about your own child? And here's little Buffy in the, in the palm of your hand dead. Imagine that. That's the kind of sick devil he is. Now, if he would have listened to that, if he would have paid attention to that voice, it would have caused unbelief, and he would have never been used in ministry. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23 to 24, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Say it with me. All things are possible to them that believe. Come on, say it with me. All things are possible to them that believe. I like a participating crowd. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Wait a minute. It's kind of an oxymoron there. Lord, I believe. Help thy, thou my unbelief. How can that be? Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. You have to think about that. Lord, I believe. I believe God. I believe Jesus. You can do it. Here's where people struggle with. But I don't know if I believe if you will do it. So whenever you're, not, you're on shaky ground, you, you believe Jesus can do it. But will he do it? That's when you say, Lord, help my unbelief. I'm not sure if you're willing to do it, but I'm, I believe you can do it. The third thing we need to do. Let me reiterate for a moment. First, we must what? Listen to what? We must listen to the word. Second, we must believe the word. And third, we must speak the word. It is another thing to hear the word, believe the word, but you also must speak the word. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, God says this. He says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. How does God's word go forth from his mouth today? Huh? 
through your mouth, through my mouth. In Romans, it talks about evangelism and going out and spreading the gospel. It says, how shall they hear unless the preacher is sent? So in other words, God uses the word, and we must speak the word, not our words. We can't create a, an a ant to a flea. We have no power to do that. But God's word is powerful, quick, sharper than any two-edged sword. And when you speak the word of God, you're speaking what God says, and you're believing what God says over what your feelings are, your emotions are, or what you think. You begin to speak God's word. When the devil comes to you and says, you're not saved, you're not going to heaven, speak the word of God. For neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor wickedness in high places, shall, or, or, or things to come, or things that will be, shall separate me from the love of God. I paraphrased a little bit, because I don't know that verbatim, but that's, you get the gist of it. When he comes and says, you're ugly, nobody loves you in that, nobody will ever love you, because you're just a plain nasty person. You begin to think about that. You will dwell on that, and you will actually become that. For as a man thinketh, so is he, the Bible says. So you need the word of God in you to say this. And speak out the word of God. It says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God makes no junk. Come on, somebody. God made you. After he was done, he went, Woo! Now that's a fine piece of work. Do you believe that, though? Do you? See, when you let feelings and emotions and things, what people say to you, how many know that words can, words can hurt? Amen. Amen. What is that scripture that says the life and death is in the power of the tongue? And we understand what that means in context. But that can hurt. People can hurt you with their words. But you can be healed with words too. You can be encouraged with words. You can be discouraged with words. You can be lifted up with words. You can be cast down with words. We must speak the word. So will my word which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. I remember one time I was really, really sick. I was having a lot of congestion in my chest. and felt like I was going to die. I remember laying on my bed and taking the Bible and just opening it and putting it on my chest. And I would say the scripture, Lord, you sent your word and healed them. Lord, you're going to heal me. I don't care what I'm feeling at the moment. The pain is real. The breathing is difficult. But I'm going to trust in your word. And I fell asleep with that Bible on my chest. And when I woke up, I wasn't all better, but I felt all whole lot better. The more you stand on the word, the more you come against the ideologies and philosophies of the devil, the more victory you'll have. When he comes with that temptation and he comes to tempt you, and if you just stand and say, you know what? That old Joe is dead. That Joe no longer lives because it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And my old man was crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago. I don't have to behave that way any longer. But see, where we give in is when we begin to listen to the wrong voice. We must speak the word. He says, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. 
and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. I remember when I went to India the first time. <clears throat> Before I left, God gave me a word out of Genesis. It says, I will bring you back to this land again. When I went to India and I was there for six weeks, I was so sick. If I could describe to you losing 45 pounds in those six weeks, I'll tell you, that's a, that's a diet plan. Some of you ladies might like that, but it's, it's rough. But dysentery every day, a fever every day, riding on motorcycles, riding in crowded cars, riding in pouring rain to villages, preaching the gospel. And when it came time for my journey to end at six weeks, being in the airport, I heard the audible voice of Satan behind me speaking this to me. You are going to die. And they had to bring me to the doctor of the airport to, to examine me to see if I was well enough to fly. That's how sick I was. And when I heard that voice say to me, you are going to die. I And the guy was wheeling me on go into the plane after I got cleared to go on. I heard that voice, and I said this out loud. I don't know what the guy ever thought of it, but I didn't care. I said, devil, you are a liar, but God has given me a word and said that he will bring me back. See, speak it out. He will bring me back again to my own land. And not in a coffin, but I'll go back. Alive. God gave me that word to stand on in that time of trial. We must speak the word of God. Not, which, not creating things by yourself. Oh, I created an atmosphere. No, 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 no. 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 It's not about you. It's about the word of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. It says, but he answered, Jesus answered, it is what? Written. What is that? What's written? What's written? He's fighting the devil. He could just say, be gone. But how did he fight the devil? He was the Word. But how did he fight the devil? With the Word. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word. Not just Old Testament, not just New Testament. Every word. You live by every word. Don't be robbed of the blessings. Don't be robbed by allowing the effective word in your life. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. We can only speak what God says <clears throat> in His Word. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not our words, it's His words. Speak God's Word about your situation. Speak God's Word about your health. Speak God's Word about your problems. Do you have problems this morning? Do you have circumstances and situations? Speak the word of God. Do you have a need? Speak the word. Now you can either worry, you can get all upset and you know, 
upset stomach and indigestion, heartburn, dysentery, all that good stuff that comes along with nerves. Or you can quote the word. Yes, I'm in need. Yes, I am in desperate financial need. But my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Speak it out. When you speak it out, it becomes believable. It becomes strength. When you speak it out, it's not just something internal. See, if you speak it internally, the devil can't hear you. But when you speak it out, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. You can begin to dance and shout, hallelujah, that God will provide. But if something happens and he doesn't provide, then you need to take an inventory and say, God, have I done something foolishly? Have I not given what belongs to you? Come on. Understand that. God will not bless your disobedience. What about your situation? Maybe you're seeking Him for deliverance. Maybe something has a strong hold on you. Speak the word. They that call upon the Lord shall be delivered. That's what the word says. They that call the, upon the Lord. They that call upon the Lord. They that call. That's the present imperative. It's a continuous calling. It's not a one-time call. God, help. No. Continue. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Deliverance is just a short, short space away from you. You know what I believe God brings deliverance? When you come to the end of yourself. When you, when you finally admit to God that you can't handle it, you can't do it. That's when God steps in. And he does it just like that. And you go, my word. Man, I've been trying all these years trying to get rid of this thing. and I can't get rid of this thing. And he says, that's right, you can. If you could do it, you don't need me. If you can do it, you don't need me. But I'm here to help you. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. To implement the things that God wants to implement. So the three things we have. Number one is... No, no, not just listen. Listen to the word of God. The second thing is believing in the word. The third is speak the word. And the fourth thing is do God's word. Hallelujah. James 1.22 says this. And I'm going to read it from the uh, Amplified, I believe. But prove yourselves. Prove yourselves doers of the word actively and continually obeying God's precepts and not merely listeners. Come on. If you want the effective word operating in your life, do God's word. Not merely listeners who hear the word, but fail to internalize its meaning. Diluting, listen to this, Deluding yourselves by un, 
sound reasoning. Hello? I'm ringing your doorbell. Are you home? Unsound reasoning. You're deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning. This is the amplified version. Contrary to the truth. Feelings aren't necessarily truth. I really don't feel like going to church this week. I really don't want to be in church. I feel like I don't want to be there. Or do you go by faith? God's word says what? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see the day drawing nigh. Don't forsake it. So guess what? God's word says that. I hear it. I receive it. I believe it. Come on. And now I'm doing it. I'm going to church, devil. Hallelujah. You're not going to rob me of a blessing. And you're not going to rob me of being a blessing. Because it's not only about coming and being blessed, but it's also being a blessing to someone else. Because something you may say, uh, maybe a smile or a hug, or whatever it may be, or your gift that God has given you to be operating in the body of Christ, you may be a blessing. So every time you miss, unless it's legitimate. But deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning, contrary to the truth, for if anyone listens to the word without obeying it, he is like a man who looks very carefully at his natural face in a mirror. Know what that's saying there? If you listen to God's word and you don't obey it, you can only see the natural. You can't see the spiritual. All you see is a reflection of yourself. Come on, somebody. Faith is taking your eyes off of yourself. And putting your eyes upon Him. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who lives inside of you? Now, are we talking about a religious Jesus? Are we talking about a, a, a philosophy of Jesus lives inside of you? Or does the real person, the real person, his spirit, does his spirit live inside of you? Then if God's spirit lives inside of you, you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. See the word? If Christ lives in you, you have the same resurrected power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwelling inside of you. It's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Whoa. Rababa. Same spirit. Not a different one. The same Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. Then, when you've come and faced the battles of life, when you face the hard trials and valleys of life, you can speak the Word of God, not go by what you think or how you feel. But speak the word that says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Trying to tear down my faith, trying to move me away from God, trying to tempt me away from God. Greater is he that is in me 
than he that's in the world. And I don't care if it comes, the devil uses your, your sister or your brother or your auntie or your uncle or a friend or a relative. It does not matter because the devil can use people too. <coughs> Excuse me. I like what God's word says. See, you've got to get the word in you. Not just to read it as a book, but it's life. Whose report will you believe? Hallelujah. We will believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. They came back from spying the land. Come on. And a bunch of them saw in the natural. They were hearers of the word, but not doers. They came back, all they could see in the natural. Wow, you know, oh, gee whiz, the giants over there. We can't conquer that land. It's, they got too many army. They got too many people. We, we'll never get over there. We're not going to. I didn't see no milk and honey over there. I, I. But there were two that went and said, we can take it. Because we're not going in our own strength. God says he's going to give us the land. He's going to give it to us. So therefore, we're going to believe God. We're going to listen to God. We're going to believe God. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We're going to speak what God said. And we're going to obey it. What was the outcome? What was the outcome of that battle? They had victory. Come on, somebody. They had the victory. See, don't just look at this as just a book. This is life. This is life. The letter without the Spirit is dead, the Bible says. But now that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, this book is alive. It's life to those who believe, to those who listen. Come on, somebody. To those, who to, to those who will listen, to those who believe, to those who will speak it, and to those who believe it. We speak things all the time. We speak all the time. I'm not going there. I'm going here. I'm not doing that. I'm going to do this. I'm not going up. I'm going down. We speak all the time. We speak direction to ourselves all the time. I'm going to take a right here. I'm not going to go left there. I'm going down this road. I'm not going down that road. We're always speaking things to us. And we speak it in our minds, but we're still speaking it. I think I'll get a coffee today. I think I'll get a donut. Come on, somebody. I think I'll have pizza for supper. We're always speaking something. And then when we speak it, it becomes an existence to us because we go and get it and we fulfill it. We do it, right? Now, literally, it doesn't happen. I don't. If I feel like a pizza, I'm not going to look like pepperonis hanging all over me. But you understand, spiritually, in the spiritual realm, when you come into church, don't come in with your garbage. And if you do have garbage, you know, I, I wish sometimes we could see in the spirit. We see people coming into church dragging hefty bags of garbage. Oh God, I don't think I can make it another mile. You know what we need to do when we come to church? Leave your garbage at the altar. Come to the altar. Where's, where's the altar ministry we used to have years ago? Where's the altar ministry where you could come and, and, and God would counsel with you? Are you hearing me? God would counsel with you right here at the altar. He would speak to you right here at the altar. Now we've replaced it with Christian psychologists. And we've got to go to all kinds of psychology and everything. When God can solve your problems right here at this altar. If you don't believe that, I'm sorry, I do.
Amen. Now, if you have to go to a psychiatrist, go. If you have to go to a, a, I don't have a problem with that. But I believe that's the exception to the rule, not the rule. Right here. You can tell how bad people want God. I remember early on, there was people in our church, they come into church, they go right to the altar, get on their knees, crying out to God. It was awesome. But when we get away from seeking God, when we get away from the Word of God, when we get away from believing the Word, when we get away from speaking the Word, when we get away from doing the Word, then we expect God to do His part, and He's not going to do it. Because you know why? It only leaves us in a, in a place of rebellion. Why would He bless our rebellion? I read somewhere the other day uh, that a partial obedience is still rebellion. I'll say it again. Partial obedience is still rebellion. And I know I've had other people tell me, you know, when they're sitting there when I'm speaking things, they say, who does he think he is? And I tell you, it's not me. Hey, if you want to continue down the road you're going, no skin off my nose, keep going. But I can tell you this, I know what works for me. Works for me. Who could be any more messed up than I was? I'm serious. I was messed up in the world. I was emotionally messed up. I had feelings and emotions that were screaming all over the place. I was insecure. I was jealous. I couldn't hold on to relationships because of my jealousy. I had all of those things. But when I came to Christ, hallelujah, he set me free from that where I'm not so you know, submitted to my feelings. I learned to walk by faith, not by sight. I learned to go by not what I feel, but what I know. What I know to be true. You learn to trust. Come on, somebody. Matthew 7.24 says this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. What's a rock? Solid. Rock is solid. Amen. Something solidified when you do, when you hear and you do God's word. You know, there's an emotion. I'm going to close with this. There's an emotion that tags itself along with doing God's word. You know what it is? One of the things I often hear people say. When I'm talking with them. I wish I could be happy again. I wish I could experience happiness. Look at John 13, 17. I'll read you my version. But I read this one too. If you know these things, Jesus said, what? Huh? Come on. Happy. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Are you happy? If you know these things, happy are ye if you what? Hear them? Read them? Come on. Do them. If you, yes, thank you, Jesus. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So the feelings come after the action. 
If you do them, you're going to be happy. Doesn't it make you happy when your kids obey you? Huh? When you tell them, throw out the garbage, please, and they go, okay, mommy, and they go grab the garbage, and first time, and they go and they throw that garbage out, right? But how frustrating it is to keep telling your child over and over again, throw out the garbage, and then uh, five minutes later, throw out the garbage. I, you going to throw out that garbage? Am I right? But it makes you happy, right? When they're being obedient. Can you pick up your clothes, please? And you see them pick up their clothes. And say, okay, mommy, I'll, okay, I'll do it. Right? It brings happiness. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So in closing, the second time. The effective word to make God's word effective in your life. Number one, you must what? Listen to the word of God. And it comes in various forms and fashions, right? It can come through a donkey. Don't go looking for donkeys now. It can come through a preacher. Come through, come through an unsaved person. But you always got to examine it to make sure it lines up with God's word. Number two, you must what? You must believe the word. That's a continual believing. That's not a one-time belief. That's not the aorist tense in the, in the Greek, to believe once and once only. No, it's present imperative. Continuous, repeatedly believing. Three, you must what? You must speak the word of God out. Speak the word like Jesus did to the devil. Speak the word out. It is written. It is written. This is what God's word says. I know this is how I feel, but this is what God's word says. And then the fourth thing is, do the word of God. And in doing these four things, you will have an effective relationship with the word, and the word will have an effective relationship with you. Amen? Praise God. Shall we stand in closing? I hope this helps somebody today. We used to sing a song years ago. Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. Remember that song? You don't remember that one? Wow. <laughs> make us an instrument. You know, sometimes people don't feel like they're an instrument. But you are. All you're doing is a little tuning up, a little tightening of the strings. You get an old violin sitting around in the closet somewhere, it goes out of tune. And if you play that thing, it sounds the most horrible screeching sound you ever heard in your life. But the moment you take that violin and you tune that thing up, and you get the right pitch and you get the right notes, on that violin, and they begin to play that violin. It's like sweet. That's what God wants to do with you today. He wants to tune you up. And if you've been out of tune a little bit, it's okay. God will tune you back in. So if you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of God has said this morning. And Father, I pray, God, that you'll be with everyone. Touch everyone. Let your word become number one in their life. Before they reach for anything else, God, may they reach for your word. Lord, before they try with their own willpower to resist sin, may they reach for your word that says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let them reach for the word, God, before they reach for anything else. For a tumultuous mind and heart. Let him reach for the word that says he will keep your mind in perfect peace as your mind is stayed upon him. Let them go to the word before they go to a drug. Father, thank you. 
For thy word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. I love your word more than all the treasures of the earth. That's scripture. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of sun. Father, I pray, God, that we will depend more upon your word, especially in these last days as the devil's really pulling out his arsenal of nuclear weapons, of doubt and unbelief, tearing apart people's faith. God, give us your word. And let it be imparted to our hearts so that we can stand in the last days, having done all to stand, to stand firm. I pray everyone that's heard this message both here and on Facebook, will, by your Spirit, God, receive what you wanted to tell them today. I pray, God, they won't resist it. And I pray that there be fruit as they apply it. Not only in their lives, but in the lives of those who they will touch, they will minister to, that people would see you in their life see what you have accomplished in their life, even without a word being spoken. Now bless them as they go in and they're coming out, they're lying down and they're rising up. And give them a day and a day that will be a blessing and not a curse. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Greet one another before you go.